This video is brought to you by Linode, link down below for a $100 60 day credit, more on them a little bit later. This right here is the Pi Boy XRS, a case for the Raspberry Pi 4 that resembles the look and feel of an old school Game Boy. But unlike a Game Boy, because it has a Raspberry Pi 4 inside, you can use it to play games from N64, PlayStation 1, and of course a variety of other systems. In this video, we're gonna be talking about what you need to do to put this thing together, run their custom version of RetroPie, and talk about my overall experience using it as a gaming handheld and discussing whether or not if it is actually worth it. And quick spoiler, if you already have a Raspberry Pi 4, yes, it's probably worth it. If not, for the price, there are probably some better options out there. So first, the unboxing and some of the specifications here. Opening it up, we were greeted with a small HDMI adapter, some stickers from Experimental Pi, the company that actually makes these devices, and of course, a separate box with the case. And opening up this box, we have the Pi Boy, some extra tools, and some other items we're gonna need, such as a USB-C charger. And it is crazy, there is an entire Raspberry Pi 4 in here, and not the actual compute mod, we have the full size thing here, making it a rather thick boy. Internally, we have a fan, a heat sink, two separate 2800 milliamp hour batteries, which of course, depending on the game and how much power you're using on the Pi, gives you anywhere from three to five hours of light. For the display here, this is a 3.5 inch IPS display with a resolution of 640 by 480. On the bottom here, we have USB-C charging as well as an audio jack port. And right here, there's a spot for that optional HDMI adapter. It does ship with the little cover for both if you don't have it and if you do have it. Right here we have a small speaker on the front and of course when the actual Pi is installed we have access to the four USB ports as well as the ethernet port. When it comes to the actual buttons and everything we have kind of the standard Nintendo layout. We have a d-pad over here. We have two small little joysticks here that actually feel pretty good to use and maneuver. We have both shoulder and trigger buttons here on the top and then we have our menu select and start. Now I will note unfortunately there isn't a dedicated button that you could go ahead and program to your hotkey, which could very well be a problem depending on the actual game you're wanting to play. And now getting on to assembly, it's actually a fairly straightforward and easy process. There are eight screws on the back keeping this together with the four screws in the middle kind of doubling as what is going to be holding your pie in place. So all you need to do is pop this off. And I do need to note you need to be careful because these uh, trigger buttons aren't really like in place. They're being held together by a little metal like probe looking thing. And they're just kind of resting in there and being held in place by the actual back cover. So if you pop it off like that, they're gonna go flying. Now in that little bag of extras, we actually have a little thermal pad that you can apply either directly to the heat, heat sink or right to your CPU. And actually putting the board in is kind of cool because everything is powered with the pogo pins. So you need to make sure and push that in there without bending or breaking anything. And that's really all you have to do. If you have the optional HDMI thing, you plug that in kind of position it with this. And before you do slide it in, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that this face plate is kind of in the proper location. And once you have everything lined up and together properly, you could go ahead and plug in the two batteries. Go ahead and put the back plate back on, making sure you're not gonna be pinching any wires or there's nothing in the way. Screw it on down and then you're good to go. I did start with the uh, four in the middle just to make sure the actual pie board was in place properly. Right here on the bottom, there's a little slot that comes out here exposing your SD card. Now what you're gonna want to do is uh, flash their little custom version of RetroPie. It's just your basic stock version of RetroPie, but they did add a couple scripts and little additions just to make it run and function really good on this device, including the button layout. And you could kind of see on the top there, there's other scripts and add-ons that you could do. So you can see your battery percentage, the load, what clock you're currently running at. And flashing it is as straightforward as a process as anything else really. I just threw it in etcher, flash to the SD. The first flash didn't quite work for me. I uh, was having trouble booting it up. I was getting this red indicator light flashing at me. They reached out to their support. They said simply reflash the image I did and ta-da, it worked. And loading games is gonna be the same as any other RetroPie install. You just go ahead and connect to it either via FTP or if it's connected to the same Wi-Fi as your Windows computer, it should be able to, or it should be detected in network discovery and you could go ahead and load it up that way. Drag and drop your games in and you should be good to go. The Experimental Pi website has a lot of different documentation and little guides, resources, things like that to go ahead and help you out. And even if you don't want to use their image of RetroPie, they do have the scripts and all that available so you can use your very own images if you 
do so see fit. And with the scripts, they do have their own kind of customized configuration and whatnot. I did go in here and actually overclock the thing just by changing the configuration, allowing it to go up to 200 megahertz, making it so uh, some of the 3D titles will run a little bit better. So with some configuration changes, all the games loaded up, I went ahead and booted it up for the first time. All you need to do is hold down the menu button and then you're going to be in your system. I'm not really gonna to dive too far into exactly what's going on, it's RetroPie. I have a whole separate video going over all kinds of tips, tricks, connecting the Wi-Fi, things like that. Generally, it's the exact same process. But a couple things that are unique here, this menu button, if you go ahead and tap on that, you are given options for your volume and brightness, and it tells you if you hold it down for two seconds, it's gonna power off the device. So you can't really program this menu button as the hotkey because it serves a very important function already. And with the hotkey thing, I did kind of try to go in and program my own with like one of the click buttons for a joystick. It didn't really work for me. It did read as a experimental Pi controller, which was cool. And at one point I did plug an Xbox 360 controller into this and being that is it's just RetroPie, after configuring it, it worked completely fine. Now, before we get into my actual gameplay experience and final thoughts, again, thank you Linode for sponsoring this video. If you are interested in setting up your very own Linux server, you could do so on the node with our $100 60 day credit. You could pick between a wide variety of Linux distributions or use one of their one click installers to get a specific server or service spun up with ease. Great customer service, affordable pricing for five bucks a month, you could have a Linux server. Overall, it's a super good deal. So for the games I have loaded up on here, I have a Super NES, Game Boy Advance, Nintendo 64, PSP and PlayStation. Starting with the older one, Super NES games ran absolutely fantastic. I was playing uh, Kirby for a little bit on here. Super fun, no issues with lag, and used very little of the actual system resources, giving us, of course, the uh, longest battery time. And honestly, for like the SNES, it is just a remarkable gameplay experience. Same thing with the Game Boy Advance. I was playing Crash Bandicoot. Again, with these older kind of 2D-ish games, this thing is remarkable. And even bumping up to the uh, N64, which I was playing Mario Kart on, again, there were absolutely no performance issues. On like a 4K TV, you are gonna run into a little bit of lag and whatnot, but being the fact that this is a super small, basically a 480p display, there, there was no issue. Flawless performer. And it was the same case with the uh, PlayStation 1 game I put on there, which was uh, Pac-Man World, which if you've never played is a rather interesting and fun game. I remember I actually got my uh, very first copy when I was a little kid in a 7-Eleven, which is a rather weird place to buy video games. And even on this small screen, I did come into my first bit of lag and issues, even with the system overclocked running a uh, God of War on the uh, PSP emulator. That game for the console is very graphically demanding. You're constantly doing a lot. There's a lot going on. And there was a very noticeable lag whenever I did any kind of attack maneuver. And you could even hear it kind of in the audio of just how laggy it was. But when you get into the PSP, that's when you're kind of shifting gears from more uh, retro style gaming, which is kind of the intent of this thing, to more modern gaming. For retro gaming handheld, this thing is absolutely fantastic. It is bulky, it is thick, it is kinda heavy, but overall the feel and comfort and all that is really good. The buttons aren't too far apart. Going from these uh, buttons right here down to like the kind of look around joystick is a, is a bit of an awkward maneuver, but most of the games you're gonna play, you're gonna be using this directional pad and these buttons, and for that scenario, it's really good. Or if you're in N64 playing like Mario Kart, you're using this joystick and these buttons. And overall, it is comfortable. Now, I will note, and you might be able to hear it, this thing is a, uh, the fan and all that's a little loud. Now, is it worth it? I did kind of mention in the beginning of this video, if you're somebody who has a Raspberry Pi, you love the thing, you love playing around with them, you love getting different cases, it's kind of a really niche market that people are gonna be buying these, but if you're in that niche market, and this is something you're looking for, for $150, it is a fairly decent buy. Now, if you don't have a Raspberry Pi and you're looking for something like this, uh, with the current pricing of the Raspberry Pi, they're about $165, I think, on Amazon, plus the $150 for that. You're uh, into the $300-ish price range after shipping and sales tax and all that, or like $90 more than that and a Raspberry Pi. 
you could get yourself a uh, Steam Deck, a $400 Steam Deck. Use it as a, not only everything that we've talked about, but it could play those PSP games fine. It could play Switch games fine. Some PlayStation 3 games. PlayStation 2, like a freaking dream. And um, do make sure you subscribe because I'm going to have a, a couple videos on the Steam Deck coming out. And it is going to be definitely worth checking out. With all that, anything I have mentioned in this video will be linked down below. And with that, I hope you have an absolutely beautiful day and goodbye.